When I first started out woodworking, I often made a design based on what materials I had or could easily get. By that I mean if it was a side table for example and when trying to figure out what dimension I wanted the legs I'd make that 45 mil thick if that was the material I could get. I wouldn't necessarily think to cut that down to 40 millimeters. Why do extra work type thing. These days I tend to like to design my projects first then find the materials or manipulate the materials into the correct dimension. Unfortunately, given everything that's going on in the world, I don't really have that luxury. So in this case, the design is kind of limited to what materials I have on hand. I can't go and get more materials. So I thought it'd be probably a good idea to talk about the materials I do have and how that's gonna change my approach. So the top is gonna to be a veneered blockboard panel. What's blockboard, you ask? Blockboard is similar to plywood in that it's a manufactured sheet good. Rather than having equal thickness veneers, sometimes you might even have an MDF core. The core of this is actually some pretty thick uh, blocks of poplar. So they all go in the same direction, then it's skinned in alternating directions with essentially poplar plies. The advantage of this is it's considerably lighter than plywood. Plywood, a lot of its weight comes from the glue. Because this has got more solid stuff in it, it ends up having fewer glue lines, means less weight. It is designed for veneering rather than appearance grade. So having that little bit lighter is actually quite beneficial when you might be doing a large tabletop. This material was left over from when I built the Wood Whisperer Guild gaming table. This is all I've got left of it. This will be cut down a little bit because it won't fit in my veneer bag. Now for the veneers themselves, I'll be using this Vic Ash veneer, which is all shop sawn. It's all stuff that's actually been off cuts of other projects. So whenever I've needed to cut something down from let's say 40 millimeters to 35, I've kept the off cut and I've got a whole stack of stuff here. I've done a video on that where I take a bunch of slightly thicker boards that weren't meant to be veneer and turn them into veneer. I have enough for both sides of this, which will be quite nice, but I'll need to stitch them together and edge join. I haven't got footage of uh, making them thin enough to be veneers, but I will do the stitching process. Now for the legs and frames, it's a lot of off cuts. This has come a lot from the table I built for my sister. So that's why these are particular sizes. This is what was left behind on the board. So I'll be able to get the legs from the longer stuff. Then there'll be the small aprons. Uh, and there's a couple of pieces that are skinnier than this, but longer that I can use for the solid edge of, uh, on the veneered board. The first step is to get the block board sized. I need to know what size that'll be so I can make and apply the solid edge banding. Then I'll know what size to make the veneers. After cutting the miter on one end of all parts, I could press them together and start marking exactly where they came to. Blue tape is probably borderline enough for clamping on the edge, but for now I'm just using it to hold everything in place while I use a band clamp. The veneers need to be jointed, otherwise when they are glued there will be ugly gaps. The jig I'm using is just two pieces of MDF with star knobs clamping two sheets of veneer in place. The bottom MDF piece acts as the reference surface for the flush trim bearing to joint the two veneers. This is a climb cut, but given I'm removing so little material, it isn't particularly dangerous. With the veneers jointed, they need to be stitched together to form a bigger sheet. Blue tape provides sufficient clamping force to draw them together. On the opposite side, they're flexed apart and a thin bead of glue is applied, and even more blue tape is used to clamp the joint shut. Rinse and repeat until the sheet of veneer covers the top.
Trimming the veneer sheet to be close to the size of the panel is a little tricky to do with a table saw, so a track saw or regular circular saw on top does the trick. The panel itself is the reference, leaving a little bit extra for safety during glue up. I want to talk briefly about the vacuum bag system that I use. It's a kit that I bought from Raw Rocket Australia. It includes the breather mesh, the bag, a closure, which I'll get to in a sec, and the pump. This system uses a hand pump rather than an electric pump, and it is meant more for uh, making your own skateboards, which is fantastic, but it works pretty good for veneering wood. The closure on it I didn't like, and I replaced with this wooden wooden system that you use F-clamps on to lock into place, and that works pretty well. I'm quite happy with that. The one that came with it was like a tar-based tape substance that I just found was so fiddly to use. It could take me 20 minutes to get it sealed properly. So, much better idea. I would like to get a proper VacuPress brand uh, pump, but they're pricey for shipping just for the pump from VacuPress in the US, it's 100 US dollars, which is about 180 Australian dollars at the moment. This whole kit cost me 140 delivered. There is a distributor in Australia for VacuPress, but his prices are just mind blowing. Um, for a bag that's a little bit wider, but not longer than this, vinyl bag, he wants just shy of 500 Australian dollars. You can imagine his prices on the VacuPress pumps are not great either. I've looked a little bit into the DIY vacuum press market thing. The problem is it's got so much contradicting information. Some people say it's fine, other people say that it's going to shoot toxic uh, oil mist all over the workshop and on your workpiece and there seems to be a lot of contradicting information whether you can actually filter that out or not. I'm going to stick with this because while it's not perfect it works pretty well and for the price that I paid it's really pretty forgivable compared to the other systems that I don't want to spend a thousand dollars on. The blue tape temporarily holds the veneer in position so it doesn't slide while I put it in the vacuum press. The majority of the air is evacuated using a shop vac, then a hand pump is used to finish the job. When it starts clicking, I know it's at sufficient pressure. Once dried, the veneer needs to be flush trimmed, using the edge banding as reference this time. For a decorative touch, a 5 degree chamfer is cut into the top to match the leg angle, which is up next. As mentioned I was working with what I had and I didn't have thick enough or wide enough stock for the frame so I opted to edge glue two narrower pieces then rip them to get my desired width. All frame parts are cut to length but the two long apron pieces are cut at a 5 degree angle. I'm hoping the splay will provide the extra stability that a small desk usually lacks.
The legs received the same 5 degree cut, though at this point it's just the top, not the bottom. The joints are all cut with the domino, the mortises are straight relative to the angle of the face they are going into. In my mortise and tenon series I'll be covering a jig to make those style loose tenons with a router shortly. With the joinery cut, the legs can be cut to length with the matching 5 degree angle. As this is all reject wood that's been reused, I had to deal with some of the, let's call it bonus character to the wood, by filling it with epoxy. A torch helps pop all the bubbles in the epoxy before it sets, but uh, make sure to let it run a bit first to avoid flare ups. An underappreciated feature of the Domino is that it has three width settings. The first setting is the standard or tight fit for regular Dominoes. The second is the loosey goosey setting, which gives you a little bit of wriggle room to get your alignment right because the strength of the glue is on the faces, not on the width of the Domino. So it's not really a big deal if it's a little bit loose there. The final setting is the wibbly wobbly setting, which is fantastic if you're doing panel glow ups or if you make your own chunky loose tenon stock. The advantage of using the wibbly wobbly setting for making your own loose tenons is that it's about one and a half times the width of a domino, which means that in cases where I couldn't get two dominoes, I can get one wibbly wobbly domino and can provide a lot of strength without any sort of compromise on the speed, providing I've got the wibbly wobbly size dominoes made up. Even though this is very thick shop sawn veneer, I don't want to sand through it, so I always use the pencil method to know when I've sanded enough. Scribble pencil on the workpiece and sand until the pencil is gone. To prepare for glue up, all frame parts receive a tiny round over after sanding. The two short sides were glued up first, then once they were dry, the slightly more complicated longer aprons were glued to join the whole thing together. I've taped on angled calls. These are just off cuts from cutting the legs and aprons down to size. The angled calls mean I can just use two clamps to clamp up the table and they won't try and pop off the frame. For the finish, I'm using Livos Kunos oil again. All parts receive two coats and boy does it make the quarter sawn grain pop. Because it's a stable, reduced wood movement top, I can use screws to attach the top. To screw in to the top and the frame, I need small screw blocks. Two holes are drilled and then countersunk for attaching to the apron, and one hole is drilled for the top. These are first screwed into the frame, then the frame can be screwed into the top. This desk is for Natalie to paint all her miniatures on. A dedicated surface she can call her own and not have to pack up. 
Plus this way we won't end up with spilt paint on the dining table. She's also very kindly given me permission to make shelves for her for the mini paint pots as my next project. Honey, 